and Magnus is still he's in the first row. But I'll, I'll take the first part of the presentation. So, so what is what is this HTTP? It's it's a it's 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 a new programmable layer in the network stack, sort of before the network stack, and we are seeing similar speeds as DBDK. We'll get into more details of that, and we actually have performance comparisons. Uh, and HTTP sort of ensures that the network stack stays relevant. It operates at layer two to layer three, and the network stack operates at layer four to seven. Get into a little bit more details. Uh, so I want to admit that we are not the first mover. Like there's other solutions, but 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 we, we believe that is it is different and better because our killer feature is that we are integrated with the Linux kernel, and we also have flexible sharing of the of the NIC resources. A little bit more details of what XTP is. It's a in kernel fast path, uh, and it is this programmable layer in front of the tra traditional network stack. Uh, it's already part of the upstream kernels, and actually also Rail 8. And it operates at, this, at the same speed and, uh, uh, and, and, and the level at, as, as DBDK does. And we are, we, we are seeing this, these 10x performance improvements. And one of the points of being the in-kernel in part is that we, we can accelerate certain use cases inside the kernel. For example, forwarding. I'll get into more details about that. Then the second part of the presentation, we're going to talk about AFXTP, which is an address family for XTP sockets. And it is what I categorize as a, as a hybrid uh, by kernel bypass facility, because we are allowing you to choose what packets should bypass the kernel all the way down to the driver layer and deliver that into a, a, a socket that is accessible from user space. But we have this flexibility of the BPF program, choosing what, what we want to redirect and not redirect uh, out of the kernel. So why is XTP needed? It is basically because uh, the network stack has have been optimized for layer four to seven, and we are taking this uh, performance hits, uh, like uh, once we, we get the packets, the new network stack uh, socket buffer, the SKB, is named the socket buffer because it assumes in the day where it was written like 25 years ago that everything has to go into a socket. Uh, but there are certain use cases for layer two and layer three where, you, where we we can do something faster and that don't take this, this uh, performance overhead. And that is what XDP is, it operates at this layer. So I want to admit we are not the first mover here, uh, but we believe it's different and better. So there's actually a lot of kernel bypass solutions out there. Uh, the NetMap, the DPDK, which is I think the most prominent one at the moment, PF. PF ring, I think there's also some people in the room that made that. Like long before we had something called XDP. And Google did some solution where they have the maglev, which they all of a sudden published a paper after DBDK came out uh, and claimed they did this many years before. Uh, the open, open on node, we have the, the snap switch, uh, which is also here. And there's actually a solution very similar to XDP, which is a commercial solution from HA proxy called uh, called NDIV. Uh, but so all of these kernel bypass solutions, we are hoping like we can some way find a way to 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 integrate with them, and maybe that they can use AFXTP in, inside of their solutions. So people that have been re writing software for for those systems can still continue using using that by using the AFXTP stuff. So. Why is it different or better? Well, it's not bypass. It's the in-kernel fast path. And, and the really killer fe feature is that we've integrated it into the Linux kernel. We are leveraging the, the existing ecosystem, as everybody here knows. And, and that's, that's fairly strong. We, we also have this sandboxing uh, by the, the eBPF code. Where we, we get a lot of flexibility that you don't like, like have to recompile your kernel, but you can actually put in these snippets of code that does just what you need, and don't add like too many instructions there, but you have to, you get the flexibility of, of doing this. And it's also important at the sign criteria that we have 
like very flexible sharing of, of the, the net card, the NIC, uh, so we can choose, pick and choose if a package travels into the network stack or we do something else with this packet. Uh, and we have cooperation with the network stack by, by these helpers and, and we can do this fallback handling and we also get access to like basically by running in the kernel we get access to kernel objects like we can we can do look, the lookup uh, I'm going to talk about in the in the route table a little bit later we need, we even have now in the recent kernel you can look and look up from xdp to check if there's a socket uh, uh, that that will match match this packet right now we we, we still don't allow you to directly uh, manipulate the the socket the socket object you get back but that's something we'll add later you can man manipulate the socket objects in in the in the tc hook later where you can do the same lookup so people are using this to if they want to bypass but but don't want to bypass if there's the kernel handles this socket you you, you in, the only thing you do in the xdp program is look up to a lookup if this socket is already used by the kernel then you send it to the kernel or else you will use the bypass facility and that leads on to the, the AFXDP. That's a flexible kernel bypass. And we can deliver these raw frames in user space while we are leveraging the existing NIC drivers uh, and the ecosystem for the maintainership of that. So I put a red slide to, to shock you here, like so you sort of wake up because it's fundamental to understand that I'm seeing this as a building block that, that you should use. And what do I mean by that? So I mean that I see XDP as a component. It is a core facility we are providing from the kernel, but I need you guys to pick it up and use it, actually. And you, you put it together to solve a specific task. And I'm, by putting in like fully programmable items in there, I'm not saying what, what you can do and what you cannot do. This is like, go, go invent something I couldn't imagine. And so it's not a product in itself, and I really want existing open source solutions to do it and there will also be some new ones that are going to use these components and what what I really see like HTTP is really a, like a hot sexy topic because we can do all these kind of millions of packets per second but the real potential comes when we're actually combining it with the other BPF hooks that exist in the kernel and I call it like we can construct these network pipelines by ha using these different yeah. hooks uh, the BPF hooks and that's actually what the project called Celium is doing. It's, a, it's primarily for containers. And they are, they're combining all these, these different uh, components. So now I'm going to talk about some of the, the use cases where XDP is, has already been, been used. And then I'm going, in each, each of the use cases, talk about what's the new potential and opportunities. I'm going to relate that to the to, uh, to VMs and containers. How can this, this work out? I'm speaking pretty fast, I think. Uh, <laughs> so one of the most obvious uh, use cases is the, the anti-DDoS. That was the first thing we sort of implemented that we can drop packets uh, really fast because we haven't spent a lot of CPU cycles on it because XDP happens down in the driver layer are we allowed to run this, our eBPF program, which is our XDP program? So Facebook have already for, they've been the, the front runners in this, and they've also contributed a lot upstream, and they hired the, the eBPF maintainer. Uh, but actually for one, five, five years, they have been, every packet going, going to Facebook goes through XDP in some way. And Cloudflare recently switched to XDP, and they changed the NIC vendor uh, in, in that process. Before they were running a proprietary stuff with the open on node from SolarFlare, I think. Yeah, SolarFlare. Yeah. So some of the new potential here for NTDDoS for containers and VMs is that a container, like a Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster, you would not uh, like expose that to, to the internet because that would be fairly dangerous but you could you could actually use this load XDP program on the, on the host to do denial of service protection you don't need 
if you want to expose this cluster to have another box, hardware box that does this uh, denial of service filtering because we can handle wire speed uh, packets coming in from the XTP layer. We just load it on the sort of the, the host that the, the containers run on and protect, can protect the containers. The VMs is the same story. Uh, so you can, in the host OS, you could lower the XTP program to protect the, the, the guest OS because it's fairly expensive to transfer a packet all the way into the guest to figure out that this packet shouldn't be used. And that's an easy way to overload the system. Uh, I'm, this is work in progress, the, the lowest one. Uh, Michael Serkin, all of the time, every time I meet up with him, he wants to, to be able to, from, from the, the guest, ask the host operating system by the driver to, to, to load a XTP program for it. Uh, there are some con con security concerns there. That's why I, we haven't allowed it yet. Uh, but there's a really interesting possibility that, that you, can, you can allow uh, a guest to ask the host OS to load a, a, a filter, a denial of service filter. We also have the use case of, of uh, layer 4 load balancing. So this is what Facebook is, is using. They used to use something called IPVS as a, a, a load balancer in, in the kernel. Uh, I mean, even the maintainer for the user space uh, software for that. Uh, but I even rec I'm even recommending not using it. <laughs> but uh, um, so what they did was they switched to XTP and they reported a 10, 10 times performance improvement. And not only that, they, they could remove some of the machines that did this load balancing because they do load balancing on, on the target machines themselves and shoot the packet over to the others. So it's, there's no central, po central point of uh, failure. Uh, and they even open sourced it. And it's on, on GitHub and called CatRan, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. <coughs> I think it's something to do with a fish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the new potential here is that we could also like, do load balancing into uh, VMs or containers. So for the VMs, we can, at the physical NIC layer, use the, the redirect action and redirect into a guest, uh, guest NIC. Uh, and, and this way, we avoid allocating the SKB in the host operating system, which only is used for sending the stuff into the, to the, to the guest. Uh, that's actually a really big performance improvement. Not a lot of solutions have, are really directly using this, but I'm, I'll talk more about how, how this, this could be materialized. It's actually in the kernel now. We have in the TuneTap driver, we can redirect raw frames. Uh, the performance is quite excellent. There's, there's what I'm seeing in my performance test is that it is actually, now we are depending on how the, the, the guest uh, gets scheduled. So it's a scheduling problem now uh, that, that we're hitting how many packets per second we can throw in. Um, there's a containers is a little bit more difficult to use XTP because containers, they really need, need this SKB. A structure allocated, but one funny, interesting thing you can do is from the physical NIC, you can redirect into a VTH device, which is what the containers have. And it's a fairly recent kernel uh, version you have to have. Um, but it, it sort of got what you call native support. Uh, so it can bypass like the network stack and allocates. It is the VTH that allocates and builds the SKB. Uh, and we, there's a small perf performance optimization by skipping some code. Uh, but I, I see it more interesting that you could actually run another XTP program on, on the VEGH and redirect into another container. By that, you, can, you could make interesting proxy solutions that works on this L3 layer that can, you can sort of install a, a container that only does proxies, proxy stuff for the other containers within, within uh, and, and install it as a container instead of having to having had, had that installed on, on the physical uh, host. But that's interesting use cases. Let's see if anybody does this. This is not something that is, has been done today. Could that approach also be used for uh, uh, accelerating VPN? <coughs> so if the approach could be used for accelerating so it can be used for accelerating the VPN, but what kind of VPN? I like OpenVPN. Uh, uh, that the, the user space provides the concession key for decrypting the packets uh, for the uh, network traffic. 
Yeah, so, so that I would recommend using something else called kernel TLS, which, where we can actually, uh, but um, for OpenVPN, I don't know, that that's the TLS, but I don't know what kind of crypto the OpenVPN the, does. The network traffic is symmetric, uh, encryption is not given. It's, yeah. uh, it's a session management, which is, uh, or the control channel, which is TLS. Okay. Yeah. So it's split up into two layers. Yeah. This. Yeah, this. I, I think I have repeated the question uh, that if 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 you, you could use it for accelerating like OpenVPN, some of it I wouldn't use XTP for. So I would use some of the other TC hooks for for, for accelerate, accelerating that. Uh, actually, I think I'll move on. So, also, <coughs> it's it's actually. Fairly easy to to misuse XTP in the same way as you can like use these bypass uh, solutions. Uh, so instead, I want people to be uh, sort of smart about how we can integrate XTP in the uh, in existing open source solutions and leverage the existing ecosystem for the control plane setup. But there's a, there's a trick you have to do to to do that. You have to implement some BPF helpers. And BPF helpers is something you add into the kernel. Uh, that, and that's, it's like BPF is something you, you, you load your program into the kernel. You're completely flexible there, but once we add helpers, it becomes a stable API that, that you, you provide these helpers. And, and what, what I mean by a good example of what you can use helpers for, uh, I have in this slide. So, the, the general thinking I want people to do is like see XTP as a, as a software offloading layer that can accelerate part of the network stack. And and by doing that, you could, for example, take the route lookup, which we, we already done. So we have the FIP lookup helper. We exported that as a helper function. You can call from, from XTP. So what happens is that you will allow, you'll do your normal route setup. Completely as, as you have it today, you'll install your router demons, your PGP demons, whatever, and and you will have have the kernel handle all, all this and also handle the, the neighbor 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 table or the app table lookups. And in X XDP, when you get the first packet in, you do the lookup, but it's not in the app table, so the, the lookup will fail, and you call what you call XDP pass. So we pass it on to the normal network stack, which will then do figure out, figure this out and call the app table lookup, set up a timer for when it has to to re request a new app, app lookup again, and stuff like that. And the next packet we get, get in, it has, has done the app resolution. It will do the, the lookup and get, a, get back the, 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 the next hub uh, and also the, the MAC address and the exit point for the, the um, IF index exit point. And from XTP, we can then shoot out the packet directly from, from this level. So that's that's the way of accelerating uh, the existing network stack routing, uh, and like IP routing. It both works for IP e4 and v6. Yeah, up until now, we are going to add some more stuff for MPLS. But right now, it's IP v4, IP v6. You can do this with, and 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 do routing. So it's just uh, we, we depend. It's very very simple program you have to load and and in, in the HTTP hook. Um, the next obvious target is look, doing bridge, bridge lookup. So you can like have a helper that looks up uh, in, the, in the bridge. Uh, uh, FIP, that's something called, also called FIP. Oh. But it's, it's the lookup table. And then you can accelerate bridge forwarding. And that goes into my other point of how do we accelerate into to, to, uh, to VMs, for example. If your, your VMs are set up and in a bridge that you have your VMs connected to the bridge, which is usually the normal Linux bridge, which is not very fast actually, uh, and that way we could just accelerate that directly from HTTP without doing much like other user space code around having to code a program that does this. So when when people start to play with it, is I also want to mention that how you actually transfer information between HTTP and the network stack. So one trick is you can you can modify the headers before you call a network stack. So even though you call XTP pass, you can modify the headers and poop and pu push and uh, or, or pop headers, and 
and that way influence which receive handler the network stack will use. That means you can, in principle, have the handle have the kernel handle a, a, a protocol encapsulation that the kernel doesn't know about. Uh, you still have to do some work on the transmit size, also, of course. Uh, another trick that Cloudflare uses is they take the source MAC address because that's not used anymore in, in the lookups, and you, they, they modify that with a special value, and they use it for to sample drop packets. They they, they want to sample some of the drop packets that uh, the night of service system is dropping, so they modify that, and they, later they catch it on with the IP tables rule to 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 lock that. Uh, then we have something called metadata, which is placed in front of the, the, the payload. So XTP can write just in front of the payload. It can also extend the headers, of course. But if you don't want the network stack to see these for some reason, and just some metadata you create at the XTP level, you will put that you can use these 32 bytes. So the other hooks, like the TC uh, EPPF hook, can can use this and update the fields in the SKB, but you can also like get, save other information. And the other thing is that for the AFXTP, the raw frames we deliver into user space, it will also be put in front of, of of the payload, so you can get this information there. We have a lot of interesting idea of getting the hardware actually to put, to put in this metadata. For example, getting a unique ID for every flow. That's something that the hardware can provide. A very interesting uh, thing is, is OBS, the Open V switch. So William from, from VMware have actually implemented three different ways of, of integrating with, with, with BPF. And he did a presentation for on in, in the plumpers. So we have, he actually did a full implementation of, with, of a re-implementation of OBS in, in eBPF, uh, which I thought was a little bit uh, Problematic because you basically re-implement the whole thing. The, my whole idea would, and he had to have several tail calls to to, to put in all this code <coughs> uh, to handle all the different kind of cases. Uh, so that was basically putting too much code in the BPF step, which I think was a mistake in itself. Like because you should be a little bit more smart and use the second solution to to offload a subset to XTP. Don't handle the corner cases there, but fall back. For, for for the for the corner cases, he he didn't succeed with that because he was missing some of the helpers I talked about before that he should have argumented that he wanted to add some helpers to do a lookup in the OVS kernel table. Um, what he did also was actually also implement the AFXTP uh, integration with OVS that showed huge performance gains, and I think that's what they're going with now. Uh, and we're going to hear a lot about AFXTP in. Just a minute. I'll hand over. Thank you. You gave me a couple of minutes at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was actually up here a year ago together with, uh, with Bjorn presenting AFXTP for the first time. At that point in time, it was an RFC of dubious quality. You could probably use it to scare children with it. Uh, but a lot of things have happened since then. It actually got into the kernel in uh, 418 in August, and the two first zero copy driver support uh, stuff got into 420 in, in December. So tons of stuff have happened. So what's this talk is going to be about, this part of the talk, is going to be about three things. I'm going to show you where we are performance-wise. I'm going to show you some of the use cases and tie them into what uh, uh, Jesper talked about, and then also tell you what we're going to focus on for uh, this year and try to get into the kernel. It's not going to be about how AFXTP works. If you want to know that, you should have attended last year. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, you can actually go back to the Linux Plumbers Conference paper uh, that was published in November and read it there, or just talk to Bjorn or me, or you can talk to Jesper too. He knows how it works. And there's other people in the room. <laughs> Ilias, you know how it works too. So just talk to people, and we can explain it. OK, so I'm just going to go through a little bit of the basics. I mean, Jesper already covered some of this. but Really what AFXTP is, it's the way of getting packets from XTP out to user space very, very quickly. Uh, completely unmodified. It's whatever XTP does uh, with the packet, that's what you see in user space. Uh, and actually, it is an option. I mean, you know when you write XTP program, you can either direct your packet into the 
kernel stack with XTP pass. You can redirect it to another NIC driver, get it out there. And we added an option to be able to redirect it into user space. So you can actually target, you know, you can tell exactly what socket you want to redirect. So you can actually make a load balancer in XTP to load balance packets across AFXTP sockets. You know. So really nice. So, but the, really what we're going to target here is, is performance. So where are we now? And I'm going to start by showing you where we are with the code that's in kernel.org at the moment. So for 420. Uh, and the methodology here is that we just have a you know, regular Broadwell server, 2.7 gigahertz. Uh, we use the Linux kernel 420. We have all the spectra and meltdown mitigation, mitigations on. So all of it is on. So we have not turned that off. Uh, we use two NICs, two Intel i4D NICs, 40 gig NICs. Because uh, we actually need two to show you the numbers, which is good. And we're going to use two AFXTP sockets per NIC. So it's going to be four queues that we want to use in these benchmarks. And we're going to have an XL load generator, like a commercial load generator, that's blasting at this uh, NICs at 40 gigabits per second, or per second per NIC. So just full blast. And we're going to start with just showing where we are with the current code base. So these are the zero copy drivers you find in 420. They were not optimized for performance. They were just, we were just so happy we got it in, you know, it's said, okay, just get it work and just yeah, get it in there. But I'm going to show you how we uh, compare against AF packet. Because today, I mean, if you use Linux and you want raw packets to use the space, you use AF packet. Uh, and AF packet is the purple stuff on the bottom there, which you barely see. And the green stuff is AFXTP in zero copy mode. If, if people are not aware, AF packet is TCP dump. Yes, or Wireshark and uh, libpcap, you know, or you're either, uh, lots of other applications running, but that's, that's the usual case. Uh, and this is, the green one is AFXTP in zero copy mode. Uh, on the y-axis you have uh, megabits per second, 64-bit packets. And you have three different uh, applications here on the bottom line. Millions of packets per second. Millions, of packets. Millions of packets per second. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And on the, on the bottom there you have three micro benchmarks, and they're really simple. Uh, so the first one is Rx drop to the left. It just tries to receive packets as fast as possible. It doesn't touch the data. Just receive it, drop it. I mean, anything that you do with Rx is going to be slower than this. I mean, because you're not doing anything, you're just receiving it. And Tx push is the same thing, but for uh, Tx. You use pre-generated packets and just try to send them as quickly as possible. You don't touch the data there because it's pre-generated. So anything with Tx will be slower than that. That's like the fastest you can go. And then we have another toy application that actually touches the data. It's just an L2 forwarder. It does, you know, receives the packet, does a max swap, so it touches the header, sends it out on the interface again. So two first, first ones do not touch the data. Last one touches the data. And as you can see here, we're, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25 times as fast as, as AF packet. So you can actually do uh, packet sniffing on a, you know, 40 gig wire. I mean, not if you send 64-bit packets, obviously, but if you, if you have larger packets, you can actually do it now with uh, AFXTB zero copy. Yes? It's a thing, yeah, no, actually, we'll get to that. It's actually two cores, but we'll get to that. That's very, it's like two slides, we'll get just uh, from two cores to one core, I'll, I'll show you. So it's basically one core because the application is not doing anything, but it is two cores that are used. It's, here it's your software IQ running, but we'll get to that, two slides. Yeah. So what we did then during uh, the fall was to say, Let, let's uh, actually scratch our heads and try to do some performance optimizations on this code and see where we can get. Yeah. So that's what we did and presented at the Linux Plumbers Conference. And now the previous results you have are the uh, purple, bluish stuff on the left there. And the green bars is... Uh, the patches we have in-house and are now trying to upstream uh, performance-wise. And as you can see, the, the green ones here, we can get an increase of 1.5, so 150% increase in performance with the performance optimizations that we have now. And some of them are really simple, uh, and we've already upstreamed some, some of them. Others are more complicated, but this is what you can get now. So we're talking here like uh, receiving 39 million packets a second for, you know, uh, one application core and one software IQ core, and TX we can get all the way to 68 million packets a second, which is uh, 
pretty impressive, I think. And then when you start to touch the data here, of course it drops because you have to bring you know, headers and stuff into your uh, cache, and we're down to uh, 22. But still, the, you know, the improvement here is like from 90, 85, 90% to 150% compared to what we have now in the 420 kernel. So now I think, with the, if you look at the green stuff here, it's starting to look pretty good. You know. But we'll get to the question you had there. So, how are you actually running this? And th there's, a, there's a link down here to the paper. And the paper will tell you all about you know, the performance optimizations we did to get to this. But I'm not going to go through that today. But please click on the link, you know, download the paper, and take, it, take a look. So, how do we actually run this? And that gets to your question. So, currently, with the benchmarks I showed you, we run this in what we call, it's just going to call it run to completion mode. So we have two cores. One core is just doing the soft IQ, so just receiving the packets from in, in NAPI mode. And the other core is the application. In this, uh, you know, puny little micro benchmarks, the application core is not basically going to do anything. It's going to receive packet and drop it or just send them. So it's just going to be very lightly loaded, and the soft IQ is going to be 100% loaded. So that's the bottleneck. But really, this is not how you would like to run it, because you're going to waste the whole application core spinning, because it's just busy polling. It's 100%. You know, and it seems that most people don't want to do that. They want to do something where you actually can sleep. You, know, you call a syscall, go into the kernel. If you're not doing anything, you can schedule in something else, or power save, or whatever you want to do. So then we can actually do that. So we have to the right there is what, what we call the poll syscall. So if you just take the file descriptor, or the socket, and provide it to the poll syscall, and call it, there's something called the busy poll. Uh, it's really confusing. It's called the busy poll mode of poll. Uh, I'm just going to call it the poll syscall. What it does is when you call poll, the code is going to itself drive the NAPI context in the driver. So the application calls poll, you go down, it starts to run the driver you know, in the same context, get some packets, go up again to the application, the application reads them. So what you get there is that you get more like a DPDK way of of doing it. It's just one core driving the whole thing. The so one core where you have the application, you have the RXTX poll, you know, the NAPI, and so on. So use it only a single core. Uh, the difference here, of course, between DPDK and DPDK, all of this will run in user space. You have no, you know, sweet mode switches between user space and kernel. We have to pay for that, of course, and the syscall. But you're not going to call poll for every single packet. You call it for a batch of packets. And in the examples we have, it's like 64, but you can, you can, you can uh, tune it. Uh, this support, uh, the basic poll support, is actually in, uh, in the kernel already. But this support where you can execute all the way to NAPI, it's not in the 420 kernel. So I'm working on that, and I'll send some RFC out uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so, it, but it seems like people, that's, that's what people want to use. So how does that look performance-wise? Of course it's going to drop. We're using just one single core. We have to do mode switches. We have to do syscalls. So it's going to drop compared to the other mode. And what you can see here, it's like it, for the RX drop, it drops from 39 down to 30, you know, from 68 to 51 for TX, and a drop from 22 to 16. So we, we have a drop of 20, 30% compared to, but we're only using one core now instead of two cores. So if you look at it on a per core basis, we're actually performing better. Because you can now use two cores to process it. And of course, that will be doubled, and it would be 60 million packets a second for RX drop, and 100, you know, uh, 2 million packets a second for TX push, and so on. So I still, if you look at it like that, this actually performs better. But the key question is now, how do we compare to DPDK? Because DPDK is the benchmark of how fast you can go. Uh, so if we compare here, now we have <coughs> four uh, graphs on each single benchmark. So furthest to the left, you have the run-to-completion mode in AFXB, where we use two cores. <coughs> and uh, the green one is the pulse syscall. We use a single core and a syscall to go into the kernel. And then you have DPDK with a scalar driver. So same kind of driver that we use in Linux, it's scalar. And then you have furthest to the right, the uh, Yellow one, or orange one, is going to be DPDK via the vectorized drivers. And we don't have any vectorized drivers in the kernel, uh, at least not yet. If we just uh, ignore the vectorized driver first and just look at the other one, we can see that we're still lagging some behind for, for, the, uh, for the RX path. It's uh, maybe a 40% drop if I compare the, 
uh, the policy is called with, uh, with DPDK because DPDK here is only using a single core. It's not using two cores. You know, so it's really, it should be compared to the policy score. Uh, on TX it looks better. I mean, run to completion mode actually it's, it's faster than the DPDK scalar driver again. But if you look at the, uh, at the policies call, which uses as many cores as DPDK, it's still a drop there really within uh, maybe 20% you know, or 80% of DPDK speed there. And it's similar result if you go to L2 forward. It's a 10%, you know, 12% uh, uh, drop there, or 20% drop you know, for that. But really, you also, also can see here that, yes, you know, the vectorized drive, at least in these very simple ones, it doesn't pay off that much for the TX push or or the L2 forward, but it does have a, a significant uh, performance improvement on the RX side. So I don't know if it's more efficient on RX side, Bruce can comment on that, but uh, there it's really, I mean, it's like a 30% more than that uh, performance gain. So you can argue, so should you start to implement these things in, uh, in a Linux driver? You know, I don't know, it's, it's complicated to write them, it's hard to maintain, but if they give a significant performance improvement, maybe it's worth it, you know. I think it's, it's a good question. But now, at least, I think for the you know, TX side here, it's starting to look good. This is within the you know, bounds of what I think. Okay, yeah, this is reasonable. We're never, ever going to be as fast as DPDK because we're, you know, we're doing syscalls. We have user space versus kernel space and those things. But uh, it, it's, it's getting there now, I think. So. But our side, we need to dis do some stuff. And Jesper has some ideas. I mean, you, you and Björn are looking into some performance improvements here. So and we have other ideas to introduce, which are not in this. You know, so it's still possible to improve this. Okay, so let's look at some uh, uh, examples of use cases for XDP. <coughs> so the first one, obvious one, is to write an AFXDP PMD for DPDK. Because AFXDP is about getting raw packets out to user space quickly. And, you know, if you have something up there, for example, uh, uh, or a user stack, you're probably going to use DPDK. So this is the most obvious one. And we actually have an RFC out on the uh, DPDK mailing list for a, an AFXDP PMD driver. And it has about 1% overhead, you know, compared to just running AFXDP, which I think is, is good. It's actually less than 1% overhead. But the advantage is here is that, you know, what you really can do here is like, which is nice, if you have a stream of packets coming into your, uh, your system, and some of it needs to go to the kernel stack, and some of it should go to user space to some processing. XDP is a great way of solving that. You know, because it can divert already in the driver some traffic to the st kernel stack and some traffic up to, uh, up to DPDK you know, in, in the user space stack. It also creates a hardware independent application binding. If you only have the PMD of AFXDP, it's going to work on all drivers supporting AFXDP. If you have a user space driver, DPDK driver, of course it's not going to work on the next generation of anything because you don't have driver in there. So that's also good. Uh, it also provides isolation and robustness. You're not sharing any memory. You can restart it. You can use all these security features of Linux because it, you know, it doesn't rely on physical contiguous memory and stuff like that. You know, AFXCP is just another socket. And we think it's going to be a, a good, uh, good support for cloud native, a good solution in the cloud native space too. Because you know, AFXP is just a socket. It's an OS abstraction. Works really well with uh, you know, processes or containers because they're the same thing. And you get fewer setup restrictions. So we think there's a you know, good strong use case for having a, an AFXDP PMD in, in DPDK. Uh, the next one is uh, VPP, which is a very popular stack from Cisco in the FIDO project. Yes, I mean, you, you could just take, well, VPP supports VPDK. So you could take this AFXDP PMD and just run VPP. But actually, you could also just write a native AFXDP drive in VPP. Because there's, there's an AF, AVP driver uh, in, in VPP, there's an AF packet driver in VPP. So you could do that because it doesn't, VPP doesn't use that much of DPDK, basically the driver. And the rest, it just implements itself. Uh, so that would be more efficient. I don't know how much more efficient it would be, probably not that much. But it would be a lot simpler, you know, much less code and easier setup, you know, if you just used AFXDP right away there. Uh, but nobody's tried this, so is anyone working with EPP? It should be easy to hack this, so please do it. You know? It will be fun to see. Are we missing anything? Is there some functionality we need that you know, we don't have in AFXDB? And the last one, AFXDB integration with SnubSwitch. This is an idea. Is Luke here? No? Right. 
so he can't comment on it. Uh, so you can actually use uh, AFXP maybe in, in a snub, but the question here is what kind of functionality is, is, is missing. You know, and the nice thing about if you, if you do something in snub on AFXTP, it's going to work on all drivers supporting AFXTP instead of like now where you have to write them for every single driver. So this kind of becomes a hardware abstraction interface in this case. Uh, but there are some, you know, things that snub uses that we, we don't have at the moment. So the question is, uh, what do we have to add to AFXTP to support snub? But I don't think Luke can answer that, but maybe he can do that later. Yeah. Okay, so some on ongoing work. So what are we working on right now? Uh, of course, we're upstreaming these performance optimizations one by one. I mean, the, some of the simpler ones have been already upstreamed, and the more complicated ones we're working on now, like the BISIP, uh, the Paul Syscall support there. Uh, and something that uh, Bjorn and Jesper is working on is this XTP programs per queue. So now when you install an XTP program, it's per NetDev. So it covers all queues. But what they're working on is actually so you can install an XTP program on a single queue. And that's going to be a, a big performance boost on the RX path for us. It's also going to make it a lot simpler to do things. Uh, but that's, uh, I don't know how long you think it's going to take, but it's, it's, uh, it's not trivial, I guess, <laughs> to do that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, another thing we noticed, you know, when we got these things out, it was too hard to use uh, AFXTP because it required you to write an XTP program you know, compile that with a Clang compiler, load it into the kernel, lots of stuff you had to do. It was just a big headache to, to get going. I mean, sockets should be easy. That's what you want. I mean, you just want to do socket, you know, you bind it, off you go. That's it. So what I did now, and it's, it, there's a patch, it's a V3 patch up on the kernel, and it's going to be V4. It might be something else, but it's, uh, I included in the libbpf, I included helpers that make it really, really simple to set up these sockets. So basically, you only call two things. You know, you call a crate human, which is the packet area, create socket, and off you go. That's it. And there are helper functions for, it, for everything. What people used to do, they just used our sample, which was pretty rough sample, and just did cut and paste from that and you know, paste it into the programs. But now we have this library instead, libbpf, where you, where you can use uh, you know, good optimized functions for these things. And this makes the program, uh, sample program so much cleaner and nicer. Now it's only because application. You also added the, the, the BPF program in itself, right? Yes. So you don't have to go out and compile that. No. So you, C compiler yeah. or, uh, you only need GCC. That is, that is a, a small array of the BPF instructions yes. that yeah. gets loaded for you. So uh, it, it loads everything you know, under the hood, so you don't have to care about it. Of course, you can still load the XTP program, you know, your own if you want to. Of course, we don't hinder that. But this at least facilitates that option. And another thing, I mean, when I showed the AF packet uh, performance numbers, so AFXTP and AF packet does not have the same uh, functionality level. AF, AF packet has more functionality. And one thing we're missing from AFXTP is this packet clone. So what happens when you do AF packet is that one, you know, the original packet goes to the kernel and you get a copy of the packet to user space. So we don't have that functionality in XTP at this point. So what we'd like is to add this into XTP so you can say, uh, so time's up is going to show me pretty soon. I thought it was going to, oh, five minutes left, great. <laughs> uh, so we're going to add that to XTP. Uh, so you can actually clone a packet and then send it up. And then you can act, this could actually be something you could use with uh, libpcap, so with Wireshark and TCP DOM, which is nice because then suddenly you can, you can sniff a 40 gigabit per second interface, you know, with nearly a single core, not really a single core, but two cores you could do it. Uh, and there's also something we want to start, uh, start with with uh, other people is adding metadata support to AFXTP. That's also something you need, so you can put out your timestamp and things that AF packet has. Okay, to summarize, you know, XTP, the Express Data Path, is a, the new Linux kernel fast path, and AFXTP is just getting packets to user space from XTP, you know, unmodified after that. And we're trying to hit, you know, DPDK like speeds, never going to be as fast, but 80. You know, if it's 80% of that, great. Uh, and it really, it's a building block for solutions, both these things. Uh, it's not a ready solution in itself. You have to build stuff on top of it or inside it. And there are many you know, interesting upcoming use cases like Jesper talked about OVS and you know, bridges and stuff like that. And notice if you have OVS in XTP, AFXTP becomes a conduit after that, which is great. You get the traffic after OVS or after the bridge or after, you know, processing your IP or something. So it's exciting, you know. You can get more cooked traffic with AFXTP 
with the help of XTP. So, yeah, come join the fun. Questions? You talked about integration in DPDK and VPP, and what about integration in some languages? In, in terms of? In languages, like Rust. Like oh, yeah, yeah, so. VPP in Rust. Yeah, I, I saw that somebody in, in added Go language support yeah. for the FXP. I, mean, I, said, uh, I haven't seen Rust. Yeah, I have, I, we have, we're not doing anything there, but it seems that people are starting to add support. So that was, yeah, the repeat the question. So language support for AFXCP. So we saw somebody from Google adding uh, AFXCP support to Go, the Go language. But you talked about Rust. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that, but hopefully somebody's working on it. Yes? Yes. Uh, have you considered uh, any other model like a doorbell m mailbox uh, between user space and kernel space? Yeah, we have. Yes, no. Uh, yep. The sockets were implemented uh, quite a while ago when uh, different speeds were. Yes. So the, the question was: uh, Paul, it's uh, it's an overhead, yes, because it has a syscall, but uh, it's a simple model. You know, people know how it works. You know, so that's why we started with that. And we want the FXCP sockets to look like sockets and feel like sockets, because it's simple. But you're right. I mean, you could add something like a doorbell functionality, especially if you have hardware underneath that understands the doorbells. And that would be more efficient. But we haven't we have thought about that direction, but there's nothing concrete. Sorry. Yeah, and the FCP in that case would be uh, like a framework, but the applications would uh, work with different hardware and different BPF functions injected. And uh, they uh, won't need. Uh, so th the goal would be the same, but uh, they wouldn't. Uh, it's lack, lack of the mm -hmm. call would, wouldn't incur any overhead. Yeah. Hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how is the hardware dependency on your NIC? Because you said the uh, use case where they had to change to another NIC to have FTP support. Yeah, so are they, they're, uh, on AFXTP, there's three. Um, three different modes you can run in. You can run in what's called XTP XKB mode, which works on any NIC. Doesn't have any, you know, any NIC will work, or any virtual NIC will work too. So we, we, we call it generic. Yeah, generic XTP. And so, in so it, it works on, on and by, by, by actually allocating the SKB and then, then pretending the SKB and converting the SKB into something that is contiguous memory. Uh, so it works, on, but, but of course you lose performance. Mm. And, then, and then, then you have the, like yeah, but then it's still, I mean, the performance of that mode is still three times the performance of AF packet. Yeah, but then you have the, uh, what we call the XTP drive copy mode, which is if you have XTP support added to your driver, like a lot of people here have, you know, uh, you can run that mode and it, it speeds up RX to about 10, 12 million packs a second on, on our hardware. But TX doesn't have any of that support. And then the third one is zero copy support. You have to add that into the driver. And we're trying to make that simpler. I don't know, was it like 700 lines of code, 800 lines of code? Let's say 1,000 lines of code for our driver. You know, so it, it was not, it's not something you just do in a day, but unfortunately. The, the, the important part is that the user space part looks the same. So you, you yeah. program, like, it's, you don't, that's abstracted away from you. That's an important part. Hmm. So now I still have to choose my NIC vendors carefully when I want to use HTTP. Well, yes. yes. Yeah. Today you have to choose Intel, actually, too. Get you supported, but you you or, can you or, can or, or uh, tell Melanox. Melanox is actually uh, Melanox too. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the XTP drive support, you can pick a lot of vendors like Netronome and you know Netronome a lot of works, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. But for the zero copy the support, zero yes. Zero copy support is only in the But zones. yeah, I want more people to support it, so I'm just you know hope it's not only us at the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean actually, yeah, you have some implementation yeah. on ARM, <laughs> yeah. so so for zero copy. So there's another question. Oh, you should have that. <laughs> there's, 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 there was there's a person in the audience that actually tried to implement it and got rejected on the main. He's, uh, he's there. Uh, so he actually tried to implement it and it got rejected uh, upstream on on the terms that that, it, that right now XTP is like the raw Ethernet frame, and all of a sudden with Wi-Fi, it could it could start in, in different ways. So it is sort of possible, but but then we would have to introduce like different different hooks in the in the Wi-Fi to, to, to determine what kind of type of packet is this coming in. 
and this we would have to have some if statements in there and we are counting nanoseconds here so we didn't want to introduce anything that slowed down our performance for supporting uh, Wi-Fi. So I think if we want to support Wi-Fi it will be in another XDP mode so it, it will be called Wi-Fi XDP or something. Okay. That's all we have time for. Thank you very yeah. much Jesper. Thank you.